I am Suzanne Legrand, and this is Disobedient Femmes. Today, my guests are science historian and writers Anna Reeser and Layla McNeil, who has just co-written Forces of Nature, The Women Who Changed Science. Welcome. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you. It's nice to be here. When I studied history and science, it seemed that it was mainly the story of men who were making scientific discoveries. And the only woman scientist I ever heard mentioned was Marie Curie. Could you tell us first why you wrote this book and also about some of the women scientists we may not have heard of? Yeah, so Anna and I went through the same uh, graduate program in history of science, and our experience in learning the history of science, even at the grad level, was very similar to yours. Um, It was mainly the march of progress spurred on by the works of great men. Anything that we did learn about women in the history of science was largely done on our own, Um, things that we learned and found. The more that we looked on our own, the more women that we found. And we also had the great pleasure of being in a program that was associated with Marilyn Ogilvy, who in the 1970s, um, she kind of was one of the women historians who kind of spearheaded um, the movement to document women in the history of science. And she did a lot of that groundwork to even find out the names of these women when they were born, where they lived, when they died, stuff like that. We didn't even know for a lot of these women until the 1970s. Um, One thing that you'll find in our book is that Marie Curie is mentioned once at the very end, explaining why we don't talk about her in the rest of the book. (laughs) And part of that is because there were just so many other women uh, that are worth knowing about and worth learning about. And they are kind of overshadowed in our public imagination by figures like Marie Curie. Not to say that Marie Curie was not an extraordinary person who did extraordinary things, but the history of science is so much richer than the works of individuals, even individual women. Women have been participating in science in ways that don't look like the ways Marie Curie did. Um, And that um, they've been doing it since ancient period and the Middle Ages. We wanted to shine a light on on other women that you might not have heard about, um, where there's far fewer resources to find out about them. Could you tell me about some of the women scientists that you found in your research that perhaps... Um, listeners may not have heard about. One of my favorite chapters is about women archaeologists and anthropologists, particularly women of color who became anthropologists and archaeologists specifically so that they could better understand the history of their own cultures outside of the sort of white colonial gaze that had to that point been applied. So one person in particular that I am really fascinated by is Zilia Nuttall, uh, who's a Mexican-American archaeologist. And her study of indigenous uh, Mexican people really changed the narrative in Mexico that had been kind of um, laid over by this sort of colonial a study of ancient Mexico that, you know, ancient Mexicans were primitive and savages and that their culture was inferior in all these ways. And her research actually helped to change those narratives in Mexico itself among Mexican people about their own ancestors. There is a colonial tradition that has been overturned in some places, by people working on their own heritage, and in this case, women, women who didn't have university degrees because it was basically completely infeasible for them to get one, uh, who set out to do this work uh, out of a sense of obligation to their own cultures and to make sure that people understood that real history there and that people couldn't use those narratives to marginalize people anymore. And so I think Delia Nuttall is one of those people that I'm, I'm really fascinated by. You know, you hit upon one of the reasons why 
many of us may not have heard of some of these women scientists, which is that historically many women have not had access to formal education or to places where history has been recorded formally. What are some of the other reasons why women may not have been included in the history of science? So you have um, the erasure that comes from the way science has been structured, that you do have those kind of, you know, very tangible institutional barriers that don't allow women into the spaces where scientific discoveries and innovation are recorded, where they take down the names of the people who enter these halls. You know, that is one way that people have legacies, um, is the way that they are recorded in the institutions of their time. You know, when women aren't allowed there, that is one form of erasure that we find. Another form of erasure is the historical process uh, and historical analysis. Okay, so we didn't, us historians, we didn't find women on this roster of women in the Royal Society. Ergo, women were not participating in science. That is another form of erasure. Um, Instead of kind of going a little bit further and being a little bit more critical of that and asking, well, one, why weren't they there? Uh, Why weren't they allowed there? And if they weren't there, are we just going to assume that they didn't do science, they didn't do medicine, they weren't involved in, you know, the scientific culture of their time? Um, And a lot of the times the answer has come up, well, no, I guess they didn't. (laughs) But what we find is that they did. And it does take kind of turning away uh, and looking in other areas of um, study to find how women and where women were participating in science. What we find is women um, doing science in the home, integrating innovation into their everyday lives. Um, We also find women who were publishing scientific works, especially in the 19th century, but weren't publishing in scientific journals. They were publishing in the public sphere. The way, you know, kind of popular science is not considered necessarily proper science. And that has been somewhat ignored um, when we look at women's participation in science. Um, So there's all of these kind of different layers of erasure that have happened over time that have kind of kept women out of like our our days for looking at the history of science. Just to pick up on on that as well, like Layla said that, um, you know, publishing in um, the public sphere or doing science that is more publicly oriented is often not considered science and so therefore not in the purview of historians of science but I think inside science itself we do see like explicit ways that science is defined in order to exclude certain people if a science or a technical field the the sort of best example of that would be computing in the 20th century is seen as feminized then it's not it cannot by its nature as being feminine uh, be science. So women who were programming the very first computers, their work was seen as something more like needlework than scientific work. And they were doing just grunt work, calculations and uh, solving equations and all this stuff that uh, men needed someone else to do so that they could do the high-minded thinking. We see this too in places like the Harvard Observatory where um, women computers and calculators are looking at glass plates and cataloging stars and doing all the math. And the men are the ones that are on the telescope taking the observing time. And the work that women are doing is not in that time considered scientific. It's just considered like the ancillary labor that goes along with this. And so expanding our our purview means interrogating also who defines what is science in certain times and places and how how those definitions get constructed. And we find that in a lot of cases, they get constructed specifically so that women can't get paid as much as men, so that women can't have as much status as men, so that women can't get into uh, societies and uh, all the various kind of like laurel granting institutions of science. Do you think that's changed at present? 
I think yes mm-hmm. and no. <laughs> yes and but. I think that in some uh, institutions, there has been a greater awareness to these more microaggressive ways that women's work is demeaned. I don't think that there has been an overall reckoning of scientific culture that investigates that. Um, I think that it is still very much on the shoulders of women within institutions to raise that awareness, which isn't really fair. I mean, women throughout history have been carrying the onus of this, and they're continuing to do so. And we still find just the the plain everyday sexism uh, of women still being the primary caregivers at home, which takes away from the time that they're able to spend in a lab. Um, And that those types of, I mean, women used to be denied university professorships or um, admission into grad school because the assumption was that they were going to get married. Um, We don't blatantly do that anymore, but there's still the uneven allocation of domestic work that women still own um, that takes away from the time that they're able to put into research. And I think that's something that we really saw over the course of the pandemic. And I think just a few months ago, uh, there was like one thing where like women had published absolutely no papers in scientific journals during the a, a month and men had. So, I mean, like even even stuff like that, even if it's not baked into the rules of an institution, it's still very much within the culture of science and our culture at large that kind of separates women's work from men's work. And that has uh, overall impacts on the way women are able to participate in science. Yeah, it's also still true that there are more women in so-called soft sciences than there are in hard sciences. And it's because they generally have an easier time getting into those fields because they're not as exclusive. Like the culture of like high energy physics uh, has been sort of in the news in the last uh, few years as just being pretty toxic. And there's this expectation also that like their gendered expectations about what kind of science women could be interested in, like the life sciences are better suited to, to women. That kind of thing is like, Um, straight out of the 19th century and no one ever says it out loud of course but the numbers back it up and like we still have these kind of fragmented disciplinary divisions that are based on gender and these kinds of leftover Victorian ideas that are still just kind of bubbling under the surface and I think that talking about them and where they come from and the history of those ideas is really important because we don't say those things out loud. You know, that's the quiet part and we want to say the quiet part out loud. So I want to go back just a little bit um, in our discussion to talk about the fact that a lot of times women were doing things that were not considered the purview of science. And one example that I think you give is the fact that women um, practice medicine and oftentimes had quite a bit of knowledge about medicinal use of herbs, for example, but that was not considered the practice of medicine as it was practiced in that time period. It was considered folk medicine, right? So that would Mm be one example of where women were active in doing what we would consider today scientific work, but it was given a different name than than what counted as science. Right. And this is one of those instances where um, it was an expectation that women did the care work for their families and the communities. And that did involve things like um, coming up with um, medicinal recipes um, that they would hand down to the next woman in their family, um, that a lot of that knowledge was handed down orally. And that was one of the ways that women's knowledge about medicine and um, the body was kind of codified. Um, And that's not something that we consider within the purview of science because, you know, it's not written down in a journal. One thing that we really find in in medicine is that when it started to become professionalized in the 19th century, 
um, is really when the work of women as kind of lay physicians within their communities became um, kind of uh, demeaned as quackery or um, anything that kind of fell outside of what was being taught in the universities that only men were allowed in coincidentally. Um, and everything outside of that was no longer medicine. Um, none of that was proper anymore. It was just plain quackery. And so the professionalization of medicine um, really changed the way people saw the role of women in caring for the sick. And that is something that I think in going into the 20th century, we haven't really fully reckoned with as well, um, that we don't really understand how the professionalization of medicine kind of relegated women to the margins. That professionalization has shaped medicine as we know it in the 20th and 21st century. But also, I think the example that you gave of the fact that when women did get scientific training, the jobs that they were given tended to be low-level jobs that did not recognize their contributions to science or didn't give them the opportunity to do scientific research independent of um, the, the men that they largely worked for, right? Yeah, I think this is something that um, we cover in a couple of different chapters that focus on the 20th century, that the, um, the, the emergence of big science of these large-scale projects that take a lot of staff is kind of a double-edged sword for women because the project managers and investigators are seeing, well, we need a lot of people to do all these calculations or look at all of these glass plates or do all of this paperwork for the Manhattan Project or, or whatever it is, mixing up plutonium in open containers. Um, <laughs> uh, and so we can pay less if we hire women. So in the case of like the Harvard Observatory, this is a moment when there are women's colleges and people, and there are more women with college education. And so these positions are opening up for women to work in their field and to use their training, but they are sort of explicitly opening up under this kind of um, big science economics of we have to hire a bunch of people and we have to hire them as cheaply as possible. We cannot pay men what we would pay women. And that's the, that's true all across the economy in, you know, in the West at this time too. If you're working in a factory or something, women are always getting paid less. So it's this like strange moment where there are these big large-scale scientific projects that need a lot of staff and people are actually having opportunities to use their training and to go into science and work in a lab, but they're getting paid a lot less. They have much lower status. They're usually getting like massively overworked um, and they don't have an opportunity to author papers or be recognized really in any way because they're just doing this kind of grunt work. And I think when we sort of extrapolate that to our present day, we have to remember that that is the legacy of, at least in this country, in the United States, that is the, that is the like foundational image of science. So you have a big lab with a primary investigator and you hire a bunch of people to do all of this work and everybody's given a specialized job. Um, and the root of this, culture that we still have that is still the structure of how science is done on every university campus on every in every private biotech firm comes from this gendered way of doing labor and so people can have all the like diversity and inclusion statements they want they can say whatever they want publicly about who they hire like Layla said, I don't think that we have reckoned with that being the underlying structure, the underlying kind of root legacy of scientific culture and the work culture in science that we still have today. Universities are one place where scientific investigations occur, but 75% of college faculty are adjuncts. 
which means low paid, um, primarily teachers, and most of those are women and people of color, which means that 25% of the jobs that are left for tenure track jobs where somebody might be able to do scientific research tend to be occupied by white men. Mm -hmm. So in some sense, what you're talking about with respect to, you know, computers in the mid 20th century and women doing low paid grunt work for scientists who then are able to theorize is really not that different than the situation, it seems, of at least structurally of universities at present. Do, Do you think that's true? Is my observation correct in thinking that there's a connection between those two? Yeah, I absolutely think that there is. Like what I said earlier, even if institutions legally cannot have in their, you know, stated written down somewhere that women aren't allowed to do this, you know, like they used to in the 19th century and before that, they've just found different ways to relegate women to the margins and to low ranking positions with not the possibility of a lot of career advancement. One of the issues that arises as well, um, when we look at women in the sciences today, and um, how women are underrepresented and uh, that it's not just an issue of role models. It's that when you have the majority of these leadership positions and people in power that are uh, kind of, you know, white men, that they themselves have probably not investigated their participation in toxic cultures and science um, of racism and sexism, and that those types of things determine who stays in science, who's going to, going to stick it out with these men, and who's not. As an adjunct myself, the, the casualization of the workforce in academia, I think is a great analog to think about these two things together. I'm still teaching the same classes that uh, TT faculty would be teaching, but I get paid way less for it because it's just been recategorized somehow. And then you're in a you're in a lecture pool uh, with a bunch of other people who are get, not getting paid very much. Same thing as the like pool of computers or the bullpen. And you're and a, paid yeah. to teach, not to do scientific research yourself. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. That way, that way, the PIs. And the rock star professors can do that without having to worry about covering those classes. There's a third way that you mentioned that women have been erased in the history of science. And it's connected to the fact that they oftentimes have been given um, the role of assistance. And that is that their work has not been recognized and in fact also has often been stolen and claimed by male colleagues. Can you talk a little bit about that? (laughs) Yeah, so one of the things that we uh, write about in the book, we have a chapter on uh, wives, assistants, and sisters. And these are women who were able to participate in science by way of their relationship with a famous man. Um, so we talk about um, Elizabeth, Elizabeth uh, uh, Havelius. We talk about Carolyn Herschel, sister to William Herschel. Um, talk about Lady Ranelagh, who I think is maybe the less known of all of them, who was sister to Robert Boyle. How these women were very much hands-on with the work of their male partner. And a lot of times in that time period, their husband or brother welcomed the assistance that they offered and relied on it heavily to make their work happen. When we get the final published work from this, you know, sometimes years-long collaboration between husband and wife or sister and brother, that It is the man's name that appears as author, which was common practice at the time. A lot of times we don't know if a wife was participating unless the husband mentions it in the published work. In the case of Lady Ranelagh and Robert Boyle, he references her 
by a nickname that if you aren't reading that closely, you don't know who he's talking about. Um, And so we think that because of the ways that we had to kind of, and other historians have had to try to kind of pull apart the contributions of women from their male partner and how difficult that can be, um, just because sometimes they aren't named, is that that's probably a much wider phenomenon in history than we even have record of, of wives helping husbands and never getting the credit for that. Another astronomer that is really interesting too is um, Vera Rubin. And there's a great, well, I don't know, it's not a great story. It's kind of a terrible story, but the way she tells it is is great uh, about giving a presentation about her research about dark matter, where she uncovered the first evidence of this. And uh, she had a young child at the time and her advisor was like, oh, well, you clearly can't go to this conference and present your research. I'll, I would be happy to present it for you, but if I do, I'll, I'm going to put my name on it <laughs> and present it as though it were my own. And Vera Rubens took her kids to the conference and presented, and um, now she is quite well known uh, and deservedly so. But uh, I think one of the things that really surprised Layla and I when we were working on this book, just in general for for all periods, is just how often, how shameless. <laughs> I mean, men in the 19th century wrote everything down. Every bad thought they ever had about any woman they ever encountered, they wrote it down. Um, But even Vera Rubin's advisor, just very shamelessly saying, I'll present your work for you. I'm going to put my name on it, though. (laughs) I'm, I'm wondering how the practice of science changes by who does the science. One of the ways that women got involved in local and national politics around the environment was by making the argument that we are uh, uniquely situated to speak on this issue because we are women who raise children. We are housewives that take care of our home. Our home also encompasses the city and our community, and beyond that, our state and our nation. And so it was really a clever move to kind of redefine what the home is so that they could expand their space out um, into national politics. And this is an instance in which the knowledge that they have um, just going through their daily lives um, really shaped a national conversation about food purity laws, water purity, all of those things um, were started by women. And I think the environmentalism issue is is a great example to pull out from the book to demonstrate how the person doing the observing, doing the experimenting, Um, can really shape the knowledge that we have about nature and about science. And also, I I would add, what's considered worth investigating. Absolutely, yes. Absolutely. So gender does really shape scientific agendas. Oh, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. What do you hope that readers will take away from reading Forces of Nature, the women who changed science? Well, to come back to something that um, Layla said just kind of in passing at the very beginning is that the history of science is so much richer than just the biographies of individuals, even individual women, because I think it tells us so much about the way we live and where we come from and who we are, um, because science is such an integral part of our day-to-day lives now. Yeah, I guess for me, one of the things I hope readers will take away from this book is understanding that the culture and institution of science has the power to shape our modern world. And that if we want to build a better modern world, then we need to investigate the past to understand how science has been built. Um, And that includes coming to terms with 
the ways that it has been sometimes an oppressive force in people's lives. And that if we want to create a better science and more ethical science, then it does need to become less homogenous. It needs to become more democratic and more equal. And that's one of the lessons that I hope people will take from reading this book. Today on Disobedient Thems, my guests have been Anna Reeser and Layla McNeil, who have just published Forces of Nature, The Women Who Changed Science. For listeners who are interested in learning more about your work, where can they go? You can find me on Twitter at, at Anna N. Reeser. Um, yeah, that's probably the best place to find me. <laughs> yeah. Well, and we also have a website for the book as well. <laughs> Which is uh, forcesofnaturebook.com. And I have a website, which is laylamcneil.com. And that links to all of the work that I have put out on the internet, including links to um, the magazine and podcast that Anna and I run together, ladiescience.com. Thank you so much for being on Disobedient Femmes. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. Yes, thank you. This was fun. I am Suzanne Legrand. Each week on Disobedient Femmes, I bring you interviews with amazing women writers, artists, activists, and scientists who are reimagining the world. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe and let us know what you think by leaving a comment. Thanks. Yeah.